let me know when you want to get the ball rolling. Yeah, let's wait a couple more minutes for uh, folks to join in. Give them a couple more minutes and then we'll get started. So Sounds yeah, good. thank you again. Thank you everybody for, for taking your time for this uh, latest webinar. Again, it's a joint uh, production from uh, Associated Steam and Everactive and happy to spend some time to share some information around uh, exciting technology to help in your facility. Um, if you just join, we're just waiting a few minutes uh, here to get uh, some folks uh, connected. And uh, as soon as we get some minimum quorum, we will um, make some introductions uh, and get started. If through the duration of the webinar, you have any questions, feel free to add those into the chat. And then we'll have uh, some minutes at the end of the webinar where we will be sharing um, those questions with Peter and hopefully answering them. And we are recording uh, this webinar. So um, um, shortly after we're finished, uh, we will be emailing everybody that participated uh, their recording. So you will have it for your reference. Um, so good. All right, very good. So, um, well, Good afternoon, everybody. If you're in the Eastern time zone, if, if not, uh, uh, good to see you, good day. And uh, so I will, I'm very happy today to um, present uh, our webinar. Um, it's a joint production, as I mentioned before, between uh, uh, Associated Steam and, and Everactive. And uh, we're basically gonna be talking about how uh, we can improve your steam trap monitoring with uh, batteryless wireless sensors. Um, my co-host, uh, Dave Rainsford, he's the president of Associated Steam and Hot Water. He is uh, with us today. And uh, our main presenter will be uh, Peter Woodman. Peter is the director of sales engineering for Everactive and will be doing the brunt of the work today. And myself, your co-host uh, is Rafael Reyes. I'm the director of marketing on Everactive. Um, you probably have seen uh, some of the email um, communications uh, promoting this webinar. They're coming from me. So we're really excited to have you in. Um, so with any further ado, Peter, uh, welcome to the show and uh, uh, take us through. Thanks, Rafael. And thanks, Dave, for hosting us. Excited to be on with you today. Uh, I'm going to run through a few. Yeah, sure thing. I'm going to run through a few slides. And then I, we actually have a steam trap here in the room. So we'll look at the hardware as well. Um, just off the top, you know, kind of how we got here, uh, our company looked around and saw that IoT was not living up to the hype. So our story starts back in 2012, where the IBM Watson team said just three years later, there'd be a trillion IoT connected devices in the world. 2015 came and went, and we were nowhere near that number. Each successive prediction is a nosedive, right? Not cut in half, 500 billion, but 50 billion. And then that got cut in half. Uh, Every time somebody takes a swag at this, now the number gets smaller. Uh, so we're not getting the amount of data we thought out of this kind of technology. Here at Everactive, we think there's one clear reason why that is, and that's the battery problem. Uh, so I have um, seen an artificial ceiling imposed on the number of sensors people will put out there in the world uh, if they have to go back and change a battery. You know, Dave and Raphael and I have been in and out of hundreds of industrial and process environments. We have never once met somebody with that title battery changer, right? So when you ask somebody to change a battery on an industrial sensor, you're stealing cycles away from something else they could be doing. Most of these maintenance techs, you know, they have a lot on their plates already. Maintenance planners have to make sure these batteries are in stock and schedule the replacements in a timely fashion. If they fail to do that, you lose data. Uh, so, um, the other piece, the environmental tragedy side, a lot of the batteries inside industrial sensors, they're heavily packaged to make them safe. Uh, as a result, they can't be simply recycled. You can't just throw them in the bin at Home Depot while you're doing your Sunday shopping. Uh, they need to go to special facilities. And sadly, most of them end up in the trash. Uh, but even if we hit that mythical trillion sensor number, 
uh, that IBM talked about with uh, 10-year batteries, right? A, a super long battery that doesn't exist today. As those batteries aged out, there'd still be 274 million replacements every day. So that calls for a lot of those people with that title, battery changer. So, so we offer something a little bit different. Uh, we thought if you could bust through the battery obstacle and make it easier to deploy and maintain the sensor networks, instead of just putting sensors on the top five or 10% of your assets, you'd put sensors everywhere. We call ours ever sensors because you put them on a steam trap just once and then you don't go back to that trap until you know there's something wrong with it. So you don't do manual audits any longer where you go and check on your traps and 90% of them turn out to be good. Uh, you don't go back to a good trap to change a battery on a sensor because the sensor's dying. That's also a wasted trip. Uh, and you don't have to go back to the sensors to do things like software or firmware updates. We handle all that over the air. We've built a special network to do this called Evernet. It behaves a little bit like Wi-Fi, but it's got much longer range and it's easier to set up. Uh, uh, if you're familiar with LoRaWAN, the range is comparable to something like that, but the power efficiency is far, far greater. I'll have a little bit more on why Evernet's special, why we designed it that way later in the presentation. So we use this network to connect to a pretty standard looking IoT gateway. We'll put a handful of these around your plant as a part of our service, um, and they will take all that sensor data, aggregate it, and send it up to the cloud. Uh, most of our customers, we're doing this for them over LTE. So every gateway we ship has a, a 4G SIM card in it, kind of like your phone, and it'll connect to a tower and send that data right up to the cloud. If you're in a total cellular you know, black hole where there's no chance of getting out over LTE, we can also use Wi-Fi or Ethernet, but it's a lot simpler to get started if we can use a cellular provider. And uh, the company we work with, we can jump onto pretty much any cell tower. So it doesn't have to just be AT&T or T-Mobile or Sprint. We can move around between them. That data makes its way up to the cloud where we run analysis on what came off of the sensors, uh, find which traps are failed, and present the results of that to you in Sage, which you may have already seen before. That's Armstrong's fleet uh, management program for steam traps. So in there, we can store every piece of information about your steam system, and right alongside that, you'll have real-time data from our sensors uh, telling you which traps are failed and how much it's costing you uh, when they wait or what your savings potential is if you fix them sooner. So. This is kind of everything we're gonna talk about today on one slide. Uh, now let's talk a little bit more in detail about each bit and piece of it. So I'm gonna start off by talking a little bit about your steam traps. The Department of Energy tells us that steam traps fail at a 20% clip annually. Uh, and, you know, Some of our customers are down in the teens or single digits, some are over 20%, but regardless of the percentage of your traps that fail every year, there's two conditions they're gonna fall into. And the first is failed open. That's kind of like uh, leaving a faucet open and letting steam run down the drain. Uh, the global costs of that are tens of billions of dollars every year in wasted energy, paying to produce that steam that doesn't go where it's supposed to, just blowing down condensate lines and filling up receiver tanks. Uh, but the other cost of that is excess CO2 emissions, right? You have to run your boiler harder and longer if you're gonna make steam to go places where it's not designed to go. And globally, there's hundreds of millions of tons of excess CO2 uh, due to failed steam traps. So in your facility, if you're incentivized to either cut what you're spending on utilities or reduce your carbon footprint, uh, steam traps are a great place to get started. Staying on top of steam traps is important. The other uh, way that steam traps can fail is to fail closed, and that can affect your process. We've seen uh, black swan events around reliability uh, where somebody had to stop the line or uh, maybe a water hammer caused an explosion, an area had to be evacuated due to a steam leak, that sort of thing. Uh, that's the other thing that draws people to stay on top of their steam traps. Um, so here's an example of a, a literal freeze up. You know, I know most of uh, the folks on this webinar are in the Northeast. This is a photo from Northeast Ohio in the winter. The traps on the right hand side of the screen, it plugged, uh, condensate backed up into the lines here and froze because we were outdoors. The softest metal in the chain was this Y strainer, which just kind of busted open as that ice expanded, right, uh, after freezing. And then they were blowing off 125 pounds steam to atmosphere, which is a pretty wasteful condition. Uh, but we have a, a more expensive example from that too. Uh, we have another customer that uses steam for sterilizing equipment. They make pharmaceuticals and they had a couple of traps fail silently uh, while they were making batches of pharma. Uh, they didn't catch that until they started their next run. Uh, so they had a vessel full of raw materials for pharmaceuticals, realized they weren't fully sterilized. They had to flush everything, change out the traps, and rerun their SIP, their Sterilize in Place program. The cost of flushing a whole batch of pharmaceuticals is about a million dollars. Uh, so off the back of a few steam traps that would have been a couple hundred bucks to replace, uh, they had a huge disruption in their process. That's going to be many times more expensive than the waste steam implications, uh, but both of them are a good reason to stay on top of your traps. 
So what's been tried, right? How have we tried to solve this problem before? Manual audits are the big one, uh, but that's labor intensive. A human's got to get up out of a chair, grab their ultrasound gun or their UMT, spot check each individual trap. Depending on how many traps you have, uh, that could be a, a huge chore, right? Our research partner at the University of Michigan, they have 13,000 steam traps. So the best you could hope for is, get, is to get to them once a year. Some are on a three-year inspection cycle there. But even if you got to every trap every year, you're getting a single data point. The best auditor in the world is going to put that ultrasound gun onto a trap, listen for two to three minutes. That's a very, very small sample size over a year. Uh, and depending on how your uh, conditions in your process could go up and down uh, or the behavior of the trap, it's not a very complete picture of your trap's health. We've seen traps that look good for a few minutes at a time, and then they're blowing for hours in the same day. Or vice versa, traps that lose their prime momentarily and then recover. If you spot check them, you might you know, rush to judgment and say that it's bad or good prematurely. Battery powered sensors have been tried to solve this problem too, but they can be really expensive to get started, like in excess of $1,000 per instrument. If you have hundreds of steam traps and it's thousands of dollars to put sensors on them just to get started, that sinks a lot of these projects you know, before you can get going. Uh, it's just too much cost to see returns. Uh, even if you got one of those projects commissioned, you're still making a commitment now that every two years, give or take a year maybe, you're going to go back and change batteries out on those sensors. So now you're visiting good steam traps that you know are good uh, just for this new task of replacing the battery. As a result, we're not seeing people do all their steam traps with battery-powered sensors. They'll do a handful of them, but they're not willing to trade the maintenance event of inspecting a trap for the new one of managing a fleet of batteries. About 95% of the people we talk to stick with the manual audit, knowing that they have mounting losses between each one, but they haven't had a better way until now. So we'll put a sensor out on each steam trap in your facility. Uh, it's designed to always be on, uh, continuously sensing and transmitting back once a minute the state of the trap. Uh, the reason why we can do that without changing batteries constantly, like every other week, uh, is because we don't use a battery to power our system. Uh, we use harvested energy. So in the steam application, we know we have a hot pipe. So we use a thermoelectric generator to scavenge the waste heat that emanates off that pipe naturally. And we take that to power our sensor. I know that sounds like science fiction. I'll show you here in a moment kind of what that looks like in, in the real world. Uh, but know for now that the sensor is going to power itself perpetually uh, based off the steam you already have. Uh, they're durable, so IP66 is a rating for water or dust ingress into an enclosure. That means you can put these outdoors in all four seasons. You can hit them with, you know, water jets to spray them clean. Uh, they're tough. Uh, they're not going to fold under that kind of pressure. We've seen everything from 40 below zero when the polar vortex hit the upper Midwest a few winters ago uh, to 160 degree ambient temperatures in steam tunnels in the south, all without ever missing a measurement. If you have intrinsic safety requirements around your facility, our sensors are all class one div two, and we have a class one div two version of the gateway as well. Uh, so um, just depending on you know, your process requirements, uh, we can build out to suit. So think about these little sensors sitting out on your steam traps, acting as sentries, right? Phoning home, uh, telling you the state of your steam system. We think of that as a new data stream, because if you're used to seeing kind of one data point from your steam traps previously under the manual audit method, in the first hour that our sensors are out there, you'd get 60 years worth of data from your old model. That's way too much to keep up with the old way you were doing things, reading through reports and kind of thinking about your steam traps once a year. Uh, so through our monitoring and detection of failed traps, we'll alert you which traps need attention. We can do that through email, or you can just look into the Sage uh, webpage or app uh, to see your failed traps as well. And you'll see them as they pop up. You'll be able to stay on top of them. Uh, Armstrong, who makes Sage and Everactive, have worked together to make this as seamless as possible. So it's one support line. If you ever have an issue, uh, we can take care of you. You'll never get fingers pointed between the two companies. Um, and what really attracts people to this is that you get all of this without ever changing a battery. So let's talk a little bit more about our energy harvesting. That's kind of our unfair advantage. Uh, so we started at the chip level. Our founders are university professors. They met at MIT working on research around ultra low power circuits. One of them was focused on low power radios and the other was focused on low power processors. When you bring those two things together, you can make these systems that can power themselves off of ambient energy. 
The electricity you get off of a thermoelectric generator, even off of a really hot pipe, is not very much electricity. For conventional electronics, it wouldn't do much of anything at all. That's why you don't see a thermoelectric generator to power your cell phone. <laughs> it just doesn't give you enough electricity to be viable. Uh, but since we started at the chip level, we could build super high efficiency electronics for this task, this steam trap monitoring task. Uh, and that's what we've done here. Uh, so with just about a half inch of bare pipe to install our sensor on, uh, if steam is flowing through there, that's more energy than we need to stay on. Now, by the time this kind of sci-fi technology makes its way into a plant, We've thought through everything you need to deploy it and monitor it. Uh, so the sensors themselves, the mounting equipment, the gateways, that's a picture of one there on the left-hand side of the screen in the center. And that includes the LTE connection to send all the data up to the cloud, pre-configured out of the box. So you open it up, uh, plug the gateway into the wall, install the sensors on the traps, and within a few minutes, you'll see data flowing up to the cloud uh, that you can inspect in Sage. Gonna take a look at the uh, individual bits and pieces of the hardware here. Here's our sensor installed onto a, a trap. This is an inverted bucket. It's about the size of a can of Coke. Um, so you can see we clamp onto the inlet side of the pipe there on the inlet side of the trap. Uh, in addition to taking a temperature measurement right there upstream from the trap, uh, heat goes through that clamp and feeds our thermoelectric generator, which is inside that little perforated steel cage. Uh, out at the edge, that green cube with the fin, that's our sensor. So that's where all the electronics are. The fin is actually our antenna that transmits back to the gateway. And then we run a probe to the outlet side of the trap as well. Uh, this connector is kind of like a coat hanger. You form it once with your hands and it stays put. So it won't get in the way of processes or be easily snagged, anything like that. You kind of form it up once. And then we clamp down the outlet side, which has an RTD on it, uh, on the outlet side of the trap. I'm actually going to pause the slideshow here for a minute because uh, I have a, a fully instrumented trap here we can take a look at. So. And if you're in kind of the Brady Bunch view, I'm going to spotlight my video. Um, I think, Rafa, you can do that by clicking the little three dots next to my name. Or uh, folks who are on Zoom, I think if you just uh, click those dots and choose pin, it'll make my video prominent for you. So, so this is an Armstrong 813 inverted bucket. Now, when we install onto these steam traps, we take down metadata, a couple different types of metadata. First is technical metadata. So who made the trap? What model is it? What pressure are we running at? What the line size is? When this trap fails, it's not as bad as a one-inch line blowing off. Uh, it's actually less than that. Uh, there's a series of reducers inside the trap, and the narrowest point inside here is measured as the interior orifice diameter. That varies depending on the trap type, the make, the application, etc. So at the time of install, by gathering all that metadata into Sage, we'll know precisely what the waste potential is of this trap when it's failed. The other uh, data that we gather at the time of install is location-based metadata. So if you have hang tags, we can program those numbers in. We'll put in what room we're in, what location, what elevation. Uh, Sage even has a place to store photos. So you can snap a picture of the trap. And then when the alert comes through, you know exactly what you need to rebuild or repair it, uh, how much it costs you if you're waiting to do that, and exactly where you're going to perform the repair. I'm going to take a, this sensor off the trap here for a moment so we can look at the individual pieces of it. So. Uh, you don't need any specialized tools. You can do all this you know, quickly and easily with a socket set or a, a traditional wrench. Uh, obviously, you don't want to wear gloves if you're on a hot trap. So this is that probe that runs from the inlet to outlet side. And like I said, you can just kind of form it with your hands. Uh, so we'll dress these around traps as we need to. And then this is our sensor itself. Uh, I'm going to unscrew it here. This one's on hand tight. We'd go a quarter turn past that uh, with a socket if we were installed for real. And I'm going to pull this over to my desk so we can get a closer look at the individual components. Uh, one nice thing about this setup is the clamp actually has a gate in it, uh, so we don't have to take the nuts and washers all the way off, which is really helpful if you're instrumenting a steam trap that's 30 feet up in the air. So. Okay, so here's our sensor. We have a unique identifier on the side so you can tell them apart. Once we install them, you can just use the metadata inside Sage to figure out which one's which. Uh, at the base of our clamp, there's a spring-loaded RTD that takes our temperature measurement. Uh, and then as heat feeds through that clamp, it'll hit our thermoelectric generator. You can see the little red and blue wires here at the base. Inside there is something called a Seebeck device. We didn't invent that scientific principle. It's been around a long time. We're just the first to do, you know, something like this that's useful with that small amount of electricity uh, in IoT. So in there, there's a little sandwich, uh, two pieces of dissimilar metal and a transfer agent. When one side is warmer than the other, then it'll feed electricity to our sensor. I want to give you a quick point of reference. I'm wearing an Apple Watch. This is like the most power efficient consumer electronics device on the planet. The battery is really small, like the size of my thumbnail. 
Uh, it lasts about a day between charges. The big consumers of energy on this are LTE, Wi-Fi, this screen, and Bluetooth. So three out of the top four are radios. I think that's really telling, right? Before you get to the processor or the storage or the sensors, and there's a bunch of sensors in this thing too, uh, it's mostly radios that consume the electricity. So radio is a, a big part of our power budget too, but our radio, our Evernet radio, that's uh, always on, always listening, runs a thousand times lower than Bluetooth, the number four here. Uh, so if you wanted to use a thermoelectric generator like this to power an Apple Watch, it would have to be huge, like the size of this table, and have to be on something really hot, like 200 degrees C. You're never gonna find that around a steam system. Uh, so we can use just a half inch of bare pipe. That's enough to power our sensor perpetually. Uh, that's kind of our unfair advantage. So. All right, so I'm gonna head back over to the slides here and we'll talk a little bit more about what happens to the data uh, once it leaves the sensor and heads up through the cloud. Looks like we have one chat question. Uh, download for the calendar that you receive when logging in does not work. It's for something in February. Got it, okay. Sorry about that. It looks like most people were able to get on the meeting okay. Uh, we are recording this, so if you have coworkers or someone who wanted to attend and couldn't make it, uh, we'll make a recording available. Uh, after the webinar is done. Thanks for that, Brooke. Uh, so the trap here in the room, you know, that's uh, uh, a captive environment. My desktop, it's pretty simple to see what's going on. But here's a picture of a trap that's a little more difficult to instrument. We do not have to be right up on the steam trap in order for this to work. Uh, so we can install in kind of strange plumbing locations like this one. Uh, as a part of every install, there's a training period where the sensor gathers data. Uh, during that period, we can account for things like strange plumbing. So. All right, so the data leaves that sensor and it hits the cloud. We talked a little bit about why Evernet's important, just because of the power budget. If we tried to go straight from the sensor over Wi-Fi or LTE, we'd never be able to get away with such a small harvester. Uh, data leaves that gateway and heads up to the cloud where we perform our analysis, and then we can present the results of that to you in Sage. I wanna look a little bit at some sample cases of data. So uh, here's a failed trap uh, with a chart. Uh, this is the output from our sensor. The green line is the inlet side where we clamp the sensor down. This navy blue line is the outlet side where that flexible probe is. So I told you we have a training period on our sensors and we have a, a cloud analytics platform that trains on traps, does you know, advanced machine learning. Uh, it's not full blown artificial intelligence, but we have some uh, algorithmic judgments that help us determine which traps are failed and which ones aren't. You certainly don't need that here. Anybody could look at this chart and say, hey, there's a huge condensate spike around 340 where this trap blew through. And in the case of this one, it stayed this way, right? It stayed elevated. This was a terminal blow through uh, and they went out and had to repair the trap to resolve that condition. Uh, here's a before and after for a failed trap. And there's actually a third trend line on this chart I wanna show you, this baby blue line, that's the ambient temperature. So the sensor body, that little green cube with the fin on it, it can take a measurement of the temperature there. Uh, so uh, that's what you're seeing here, kind of charted alongside day, night, rise, fall, something like that. So on this failed trap, the before, you can see steam trap's not doing a whole lot there as steam blows through. There's a big dip in the center where they valved off the trap to service it. And after repairing it, you can see almost a hundred degree Fahrenheit difference once the trap is doing its job. Now these lines may be a little closer together on a low pressure steam system or further apart on high pressure. Uh, this is just what one sample trap looks like. Uh, here's something that I think is really interesting. Uh, you know, if you don't take anything else away from the presentation today, think about this for a moment. Uh, since our sensor's out there gathering data every minute, we can inspect these steam traps continuously. So if something happens during off hours, you'll be able to go back and be aware of it. Think about the old way of doing things where we spot check traps once a year, and then look at the X axis on this chart. This is a couple of days in May, right? So let's say May 15th was when we used to do our trap inspections. Get up at 8 a.m. with a pot of coffee, we go spot check all the traps in our facility and we've got a big plant. So we pull an all nighter, we finish up the next day at 4 p.m. Anywhere in that window, if we spot check this trap, we'd say, well, it looks good to me. You dust your hands off, see you next year. Meanwhile, just before we started and right after finishing, there's hours here where this trap's not doing its job. That's waste, something's wrong. This would be very, very hard to detect if we were spot checking our traps, especially if you're only doing that you know, once a year. So. Now, there are a couple of things that can lead up to behavior like this. It could be an early warning sign that a trap's gonna fail, like the previous slides I showed, uh, or this could be a systemic issue. Uh, when you put sensors on all your traps, you can detect things going on inside your steam system beyond the failure of just a single trap. We had a customer that had a couple dozen traps that all had intermittent failure signatures like this simultaneously. 
we knew it couldn't be all those traps acting bad at that time. It had to be something else going on. Uh, so they did some investigation. They were able to trace it back to boiler carryover. They serviced the boiler and it resolved this condition. Fixing the traps never would have fixed it. <laughs> so having that data logger out there as a part of our system can be really helpful in identifying strange things that could be going on outside of the traps in your steam system as well. You know, all that steam ends up in a trap at the end of the day. Uh, so if there's an issue, uh, we're gonna be able to detect it there. Uh, here's a, a plugged trap. So for traps that we expect to be in continuous operation, you know, that have a constant steam supply, we'll train and, and use the uh, um, inputs we have from our metadata to figure out where they should be based off of pressure. In the case of this one, it likes to be up here around 380F. Uh, so something got lodged in this trap and you can see the temperature trending down. Now, before it got down to the same temp as condensate and way before it gets down to ambient, we're going to be able to detect that something's wrong and send you a notification and say, hey, wait a minute, this trap doesn't usually go this cold. It's gone unexpectedly cold. Please go check on it. That could be that the trap's plugged. It could be that the strainer upstream from it is plugged or there's something going on with the, equi the equipment it's in service of. Uh, but we can tip you off a lot sooner than if you had to go figure that out on your own. One last example here. This is an outdoor trap, uninsulated, so the thermal profile is pretty chaotic. Uh, and we don't use simple thresholds to determine if a trap's failed or not, because in an environment like this, uh, there's just not enough information to, to use a threshold. You get a lot of false positives or you might miss something. Uh, so for every trap we install on, there's a training period of a couple of weeks where we learn that trap's behavior. We can then compare that to every other trap we've seen of the same make, model, application, and pressure. And we have subject matter experts who check in on these too. So if there's something anomalous, we can uh, you know, be confident that uh, we're getting good data and that we're training correctly on the trap. Okay, so let's bring this home to what the, the impact is. This is the same trap I showed you here in the room with me that the sensor was on when we started, but it's at our research partner, the University of Michigan, where they use it in an HVAC application. Uh, so there's our orifice diameter. This is a low pressure application. Their cost of steam is probably a little bit higher than yours. But if this trap is blowing for a year, it's about $14,000 in waste steam. So uh, these numbers come out of Sage. Uh, you could look this trap up, you'd see that same result. Now that's a big trap. It's the size of a roll of paper towel. You need two hands to hold it. Makes sense that there'd be a lot of waste there. Let's look at a smaller trap. This is in a customer of ours that's a dairy plant. They make coffee creamer out on the East Coast. Uh, it's a small trap. You could easily hold it with one hand, half inch lines run through it, but it's running at high pressure as a part of their process. Their steam cost is lower than the University of Michigan's. If this trap's failed for a year, it's a $24,000 problem, uh, which is, that's huge, right? That's not what you'd expect looking at a small trap like that. Now, not every steam trap is gonna be tens of thousands of dollars of waste per year, but most are in the thousands, and the ones that are in the hundreds may be strategically important to you, like they're part of a process that you can't afford to go down. So the way that we um, you know, return value for our customers is, uh, they put this sensor onto this steam trap in April of 2020. Two months into their annual inspection cycle, the trap failed. We tipped them off and they were able to fix it that week. If the sensor hadn't been there, it would have sat for another 10 months. And we can confidently say that would have been about $20,000 in waste steam. That doesn't take into account you know, the risk of plugged traps. Only you know what it costs if a trap goes down and affects your process or safety concerns. Uh, most of our uh, installations, they're paying themselves off just based off of conserved waste steam from blow through traps like these. So when we head into a customer site, uh, we first start with a steam trap survey. If you're already in Sage, we can use that. If you're not, we can pull your most recent one. We'll take the number of traps you have in your facility, uh, get the pressures there as well, ask you for your cost of steam. We'll go run down all those orifice diameters to figure out how much waste really goes through the individual traps. And then we'll be able to run a return on investment for you that looks like this. Uh, how much steam we think it is you're losing annually uh, through those waste traps, less the cost of our service, and we'll give you a net savings result. Usually these paybacks are really strong, but one of the reasons why we like to run them ahead of time is to make sure we're setting up our customers for success. We don't wanna take on a project that's not gonna pay off for you. It's not in our benefit. Uh, we run our system as a service. So if you're not seeing returns, you can stop the service. You didn't pay $1,500 upfront per sensor like the battery powered sensors. You're paying a service fee to get this monitoring. Uh, so you can discontinue it at any time, which I think is great for you, uh, but uh, the pressure is on us to make sure we're showing returns uh, in a deployment like that. The other number I wanna call your attention to here is the carbon savings. So uh, in the case of this plant, you know, pretty tremendous reduction in CO2 usage just by staying on top of their failed steam traps. About 10 or 15 years ago, 
uh, there was a big trend to swap out lighting, right? Swap to LED bulbs or CFL bulbs from incandescent bulbs to be more efficient. So if you think about taking on that same project, you'd need to find 115,000 light bulbs to have the same carbon impact as changing the number of steam traps in this plant. You know, a plant with 500 steam traps in it probably doesn't have 100,000 light bulbs. There are only so many ways you can conserve this kind of energy. And failed steam traps, fixing them sooner, it's a great way to start. One last thing I want to say, you were going to change these steam traps anyways, right? The next time you did an audit, you were going to find them and change them. The difference with our system is you find them sooner, and that's where all these savings come from. Instead of them sitting out there and you don't know about it, you find out right away by fixing them sooner. That's how you realize all these savings. So there's no net change in output by you. It's not a new maintenance task like going out and changing batteries. All right. I feel like that was a speed run. I wanted to fit a lot in in our, our 30 minutes there. I'm going to pause here for questions. I know there was one in the chat box. Don't be shy. Feel free to write your questions in there. Uh, Rafa can answer them. Uh, and, and we'll leave a few minutes here to discuss. Yeah, great, great. Thank you, Peter. This is, this is awesome. Um, I would like to say that if anybody has any additional question, uh, feel free to... Uh, email at sales at associatesteam.com uh, and then we will be able to answer any any potential additional questions that uh, you don't feel like answering here and if you're interested in knowing if this is something for your facility and wanted to know how much co2 emissions you can save or how much money you can save um, you know, I think the first step will be to share your list of steam trap, maybe from your latest uh, steam trap audit, and you can share that at sales at associatesteam.com. And with that information, we will be able to provide you with a savings estimate. So um, with that, I, I, I'm, I don't know if there's any uh, immediate questions on the folks in the room. All right, and we do have a couple of questions from um, from the chat. Um, so the first one was, um, how much does Everactive Steam Trap monitoring cost? Uh, good question. So um, yeah, we charge as a service, as I said before, which makes it really easy to understand how much it is you're gonna pay. You pay one flat fee per trap per year, uh, and uh, that includes everything from the sensor hardware, the gateway, the LTE connection, the analysis on the back end. Uh, so the cost for steam trap monitoring starts at uh, about $25 per month per trap. That's the highest price you'd ever pay. So if you have a small facility and you're only committing to you know, a year of monitoring, it starts at $25 per month per trap. Uh, if you can make a longer term commitment, like multiple years, or if you have a large facility where there's hundreds or thousands of steam traps, that number comes down. Uh, so get in touch with us. Uh, those are the levers we can use. Uh, we'll get you an accurate quote based off your number of traps and the length of commitment you can make. Great, thank you, Peter. Um, we have a few others coming through on the chat. Uh, does, does this work on any type of a steam trap? Yes, yes it does. So I showed um, Armstrong one here today. Obviously, Associated Steam is an Armstrong dealer, but we can fit to any type of steam trap. Uh, it doesn't have to be an Armstrong. It doesn't have to be a specific style. Inverted buckets, discs, uh, float and thermostatic, even orifice traps can be monitored. Orifice traps, I think, are an interesting case because they'll tell you they're maintenance-free. They, they work perfectly. But uh, we've seen periods of time where if the pressure isn't consistent leading up to that orifice trap, there are times where it will behave like it's blowing uh, and other times where it'll get flooded and backed up. So that's kind of an interesting case to get data off of if you have any orifice traps in your facility. Excellent, excellent. Another question, what is the range between the sensor and the gateway? Hi, this is Maria, can I help you? Uh, yeah, the range between the sensor and the gateway is about uh, 250 meters, uh, which is equivalent to 800 feet or so. Um, so uh, that's in an industrial environment where we won't necessarily have line of sight. You know, there might be light walls or other obstructions, air handlers, process plumbing, that sort of thing. Um, you know, RF is, Kind of an interesting thing to categorize we usually as a part of the service will send someone out to take a look around your facility uh, if you have a three foot you know thick concrete wall we'll just put a gateway on either side of it uh, there's no cost to you for the gateways you're paying a per sensor or per trap fee um, so we'll make sure you have evernet all over your facility so anywhere you have a steam trap uh, you can just pop a sensor on and go great great and um what kind of conditions of 
fail steam traps can you detect? Yeah, we covered uh, some of those in the slides. Uh, so probably the one that people are most interested in are these blowing traps, right? Blow through traps are the ones that'll uh, cost you the most money because your, your steam's running down the drain. So first and foremost, we're a blow through detector. Think of us that way. Uh, but we can also you know, uh, detect things like uh, rapid cycling or leaking by. They just look less severe than a blow through. They're not gonna cost you as much money. Uh, cold trap detection, that could cost you the most money of all, only you know how much it's going to cost. We can't calculate it the same way as a, a blowing trap because if it stops the line, that's kind of on you. So if you previously have had issues with plugged traps that uh, flooded equipment, uh, caused corrosion, you know, in that kind of equipment, or if you're doing steam tracing around your facility where you have pipelines and you need to keep things flowing, if that fails, what does it cost you? Uh, that could be far, far more expensive than a blow through. We can detect cold traps as well. Excellent, excellent. Um, another one is, do, do you offer on-site pilots or demos? We do, yes, absolutely. So if you'd like to see the technology on your site, uh, we absolutely uh, can get started without covering necessarily your entire plant. Uh, so talk to Dave or his team, email sales at associatedsteam.com. Uh, we're happy to get you kind of a starter kit uh, so you can see how the technology works, get comfortable with it. Uh, usually we can show good payback on a pilot too. If we find just a couple of failed steam traps, you know, that's going to be, um, that's going to be valuable. So. Okay. And another one here, what other types of sensors do you have? Yeah. So uh, above and beyond the steam trap monitor, we actually, I have a slide on this. We have a family of industrial sensors we're bringing to market. Uh, so the uh, second product we put on the market after the steam trap monitor was released is a machine health monitor. Uh, so this chart kind of shows um, what we can harvest from on the left hand side and uh, what we can sense. So our first product was the steam trap monitor. It's a thermoelectric generator and it's mainly using remote temperature probes, right? One on the inlet side of the pipe, one on the outlet side. That gets you a steam trap monitor. Machine health monitor, that came to market uh, about a year later. Uh, and that is primarily accelerometer data. We have a triaxial accelerometer there. You can pop that on a motor or on the driven equipment. It'll tell you if the machine's running rough or not. Uh, and that uses a thermoelectric generator on a warm spot on the machine, but it can also use a solar cell uh, to harvest light. So, and that could be like the LED or CFL lights you're sitting under now, or it could be outdoor light like the sun. Um, so uh, here on the roadmap, things that haven't been released yet and these unchecked boxes, both for the sensors and harvesters are where we're headed next. So a uh, differential pressure around air and fluid filters to determine if they're clogging up. Many of our customers have told us that for every uh, filter that they pull out, you know, that's plugged and ready to blow, if they're changing their filters on a time basis, there's probably four or five of them that were clean, but they just didn't know it wasn't time to change them yet. So they do it while they're there. Uh, we're also using ultrasound to measure pipe thickness for corrosion in pipelines. Uh, ultrasound and acoustics to listen for leaks, so leak detection in compressed air or gas around facilities. And uh, monitoring heat exchangers to see if they're fouling or plugged. Um, so that's kind of the, the near-term roadmap. Kind of a neat thing about our technology, if you start with steam trap monitoring, we'll put all the gateways up, blanket your facility in that Evernet, uh, and then we'll have the same pipeline for data to head back through the cloud. So if you wanna try another product, uh, like the machine health monitor here, or that's a pressure safety valve. <clears throat> that's another application we're working on. It's as simple as just popping the sensors on once the gateways are in place. So really easy to try that uh, if you're already on board with one product. So. Great, and we have uh, one more question here on the uh, chat. What experience do you have with manhole vault applications? Yeah, great question. Manholes and vaults can be tricky. Uh, we do have some experience doing manholes and vaults uh, with some of our customers. Um, you know, the uh, neat thing about our Evernet network is it, it, it projects really well through, you know, vault and, uh, and tunnel environments because the RF just kind of bounces around once you're down there. Uh, the, the tricky part is getting connectivity out of them. So since we start with LTE first on our gateways, uh, you know, if LTE is present in the tunnel or vault, it's really simple. Uh, if it's nearby, we can run an antenna extension cord off the gateway to get up to somewhere where there's LTE, or we can also run an ethernet wire uh, to the gateway as well. So we do have some experience monitoring traps in manholes and vaults. Uh, if there's a, uh, an application like that you're looking at, get in touch, let's talk about it. That's a particularly painful one, right? Because I know it's hard to get, uh, get humans into those spaces. We also have customers who love that they can put a batteryless sensor into a Haslock location, you know, somewhere where they don't want to send people and now they get a continuous data stream back. So they don't have to put someone at risk to go check that steam trap. 
Well, those are all the questions that we have on the um, on the chat. Um, I don't know if there might be any other questions from the people in the call. Okay. I guess I guess that's a no. So um, with that, um, I will first thank you, Peter, for the time on this webinar. On behalf of uh, EverActive and Associates team, I thank everybody for partic participating in the uh, webinar. And uh, again, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to contact sales at associatesteam.com or you can share with them your Steam trap list or your light, latest uh, Steam trap audit and we will be able to provide you a savings estimate. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Thanks to the Associated Steam team for having us. Great working with you as always. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.